Just a second. A weird Linux distribution. So, which one? It's called Cubis. Okay. And it's quite fringe, mm -hmm. but it's quite cool. It's just the problem that you know this sharing screens and things like this can be a pain. So I have also to join with my phone to make sure everything works. So I'm just doing that right now. So there may be two Augustus there. Uh, the more the merrier. Sorry? Uh, the more the merrier. Okay, finishing the setup, sorry for the delay, but now it's all set. And we still have some minutes. Oh, sorry. What's it going? Seems so, that everything's ready. We can we can start. So welcome back to the third uh, session of Augustus course on quench uh, multi-scale renormalization. And today he's going to talk about quench renormalization, the intensity of defects. Thank you, Augustus. Thank you so much. So this will be the last lecture. I was really excited to prepare and to give this course. So. It's been nice. Uh, today we're going to continue on uh, what we started yesterday, uh, sorry, on Tuesday. Uh, we're going to talk about renormalizations that are done in two steps, one for the random environment and after that one for the process that we build on top of the random environment. That's why I usually call this quenched renormalization. I don't know if it's an appropriate name at all, but we will keep using it. But there will be a big difference between today's lecture and yesterday's. So. I'm going to talk about this. Uh, just a second. Yeah, I'm going to talk about this soon. Uh, let's just review what we did in the last lecture. We considered a percolation on a, a random graph. Uh, and we did one randomization to describe the graph, saying like the defects are rare, the typical boxes are good. A good box has only one bad box inside or two adjacent bad box inside at, work, at most. Uh, and we had this idea that the, um, the defects were very large, right? We constructed the environment in a way that there could be very large gaps. So there could be very large defects and they were hard to traverse. That somehow made our life easier, ironically. Although the defects are very difficult to traverse, this allows us to be very loose in our description of the defects. So if, for example, we saw two uh, medium-sized defects that were far apart, we just say, no, this is a large defect. Just consider everything here uh, empty. Like if it was as if it were a much larger defect than it actually was. So it, it allowed us to be very loose in the description of defects. In the end, there was just a notion of good box, bad box. And now we are going to jump to a different model that was also studied previously, uh, but that didn't doesn't give us this zero. So we're going to have to be much more precise in the description of what a defect is. And why am I doing this in the last lecture? Because here is where I feel that the interplay between the random environment and the process defined on top of it is really beautiful. So they they match together very nicely, unlike the last lecture where there were just some constants that had to be tuned so that both sides of the equation work. Um, and another a last observation is that in the last lecture, we used a lot of vertical room. Since the defects were large, we had to go up a lot to find a passage. 
a stretched exponential height to find the passage through the defect. And here we are going to be in a situation that we really cannot allow ourselves uh, to go more in the vertical direction than we go in the horizontal. We have to be balanced in that sense. So this is the overall uh, uh, overview of the lecture. We're going to define the model. Then we're going to do the randomization in two steps, one for the environment, one for the percolation on top of it. And the, per the randomization on top of the percolation is going to have an interesting aspect, which is calling, called the co crossing a trap or crossing a defect. So it's going to come soon. So what's the, de the model? It's very similar to the one we defined on Tuesday. So we are going to pick Z2. And we're going to start by harming the lattice Z2 and obtaining as a consequence the sublattice uh, that is kind of stretched both horizontally and vertically. How do we do this? For every line, vertical line, we're going to toss a coin. And with probability rho, we are going to keep the, the line. And with probability 1 minus rho, we're going to delete the, the line. And you can see the zeros and ones in this picture describing exactly that. So the dashed lines are actually absent. I just plotted them so that you see there was something there before. And the same uh, we did for columns, we're going to do for rows. So now you see that we're going to do a Bernoulli percolation on top of this. So only the solid edges are going to be defined as open or closed. And you see that traversing a large interval, like in the picture there, full of zeros, it's going to be very costly because I have to pay uh, p to the length of the interval to see a, a traversal. So the large gaps horizontally, they're going to make it hard for us to cross. We're going to have to move vertically to find the, the passage. But there may, there may be a vert, uh, horizontal defect that blocks us from traversing vertically so much. So this is a simulation of the process. Again, you can later take the slides and play labyrinth there, trying to find the left, right, and a top-down crossing. There, both of them exist, but you do have to move around to, to find them. It's, uh, it's not as robust in Bernoulli, as in Bernoulli percolation, where basically looking locally, you can make sure that you cross here. You sometimes feel pretty confident, but you have to uh, wind back and try another passage. So this model was uh, introduced in a paper by Jonan Somos and Terris, where they study a three-dimensional version of it, and they proved the existence of a phase transition for the three-dimensional version. And they conjectured that the, the two-dimensional version that I just presented also has a phase transition, meaning you can find some density small enough for the defects and some large P for the percolation you're doing all over it, so that there is percolation. So this conjecture was proved correct in 2005 by Hoffman. So let's be a bit more precise, this is the theorem. There exists a row and then a P, such that the probability that the origin is connected to infinity in this model is positive. Uh, you can improve this uh, with uh, one-step arguments uh, by saying that for every row there is, so you can actually exchange uh, the order in which you pick this constant, but this is the main piece of the, the argument. The rest was kind of not. Also the, the, the ergodicity gives you that if the probability being connected to infinity has positive probability, there is almost surely an infinite connected component somewhere. Uh, and Hoffman, in his proof, he follows a renormalization scheme that is also quenched in the sense that first looks at the environment and then fixes an environment that satisfies ABC, looks at the percolation. So it's just as uh, we're going to do today, except that uh, the original paper uses dynamic renormalization, which is, uh, I find, much harder to follow. And here we're going to give a, uh, an alternative proof that is using static renormalization. And I think it's nicer for a course like this. Um, I will also uh, omit some small complications that arrived. <coughs> so, uh, 
so that the exposition is smoother. Uh, but the proof is very inspired by the dynamic one from Hoffman. So here is uh, our guide. Remember that we always use this five-step procedure to do our randomization. So we first define scales, then we find the bad event. We show that the bad event in a larger scale implies the bad event in a previous scale, the smaller one. Then we turn this uh, connection between scales into a connection between probabilities, and then we do an induction to bound the probability. So that's how we do, but we're going to do it twice, one for the environment and another for the process on top of it. Uh, the, the second one having this twist that we have to traverse the obstacles in a very explicit way. So first thing we have to do is to change a little bit how we describe the model. Uh, I, I described it first as the original article where there are columns and rows that are either present or absent. And then we do a percolation on top of this. It's not so convenient for the randomization. What we're going to do instead is uh, take another lattice Z2 that is really like the, the stretch less lattice shrunk again to look like Z2. So every ed, every vertex here it will correspond to a connection between a, a present row and a present column. And to go from one edge to the neighbor edge, it's not just P that you have to pay, it's P to the number of edges contained there. So uh, I don't know if that was clear. So <laughs> this is a, just a lattice Z2 with nearest neighbor edges, but every edge has a cost to cross which is P to the Xi. And Xi's are the number of absent columns you had between two sites plus one, uh, which is a geometric distribution. So you're just gonna pick geometric distributions for all the uh, integers in the X axis, independent ones for the Y axis. And now if you want to open an edge, if it's a horizontal one, we have to look at Xi uh, underneath, if it's a vertical one, we have to look at the Xi uh, to, to our left and take P to the power Xi plus one. And that's the cost of opening an edge. And this makes the randomization a uh, nicer. It becomes even more static. So there we go. Here's the randomization. As I said, I'm doing some simplifications for the exposition, but uh, this is the spirit. We first choose a sequence of scales, LK, which is going to be 500 to the K. So it's still a geometrically growing uh, sequence, although a bit aggressive with the 500 there. Uh, we pave the lattice Z with intervals of that length. So it's just going to be from J500 to the K to J plus 1, 500 to the K, excluding the right point. <coughs> and you see that this paving is kind of nested in the sense that we can take an interval at scale k plus one and see it as a union of 500 intervals in the previous k, as in this picture. Now, uh, it's interesting to see that the L0 is one. So the first scale is just points. Just a box, is an interval is gonna be just a point. So the big difference from last lecture to today's is that we're not just going to call intervals good or bad, depending on what happens inside. Because if we did that, as soon as an interval was bad, when trying to cross it, we would have to assume the worst, right? We would have to assume that it's so bad that we have to, you know, just cross it horizontally without moving up or down at all, like we did in the last lecture. That's too much. What we're going to do is, is we're going to grade them. So every interval is going to have uh, intensity of a defect that we call HKJ. So for an interval at scale K position J, HKJ is gonna be an integer from zero to infinity. Zero meaning the box is good. We're gonna have a good time there. And one is already a bad box. And from then on, it only gets worse. It can be as bad as, I mean, there's no limit to how bad a box can be. So we need to define this H. So we just said we're gonna do them. So at scale zero, this is gonna be very easy. L zero is one. So the first scale is just a point. So the intervals are actually just points. 
uh, and the height or the intensity of the defect at the site J is just going to be the geometric random variable Xi J. So if there was no defect, Xi J is zero, uh, and that box is good. So you see, if there is a site that has no, no bad column uh, between it and its neighbor, then the probability to connect to the neighbor is just P. And that's a good box at scale zero. Anything else is going to be bad. And how bad is it? The number of bad sites you have to cross, bad columns. OK, so that was easy. And the, the rest of the definition is going to follow some type of induction. So we're going to assume that we have defined the intensity of a defect in scale k. And you're going to uh, define the intensity at the next scale. And I think this is the heart of the, the proof, essentially. So this is the, um, this is the point where the environment communicates with the percolation. This choice is what took us the longest time. So that's why I joked in the first lecture that the thing that looked the easiest before is the, what actually turned out to be the hardest, which just defining what is bad and what's not and how bad it is. So it's a simple formula that has three cases unhappily, but it's algebraically very simple. So what do we do? If an interval has only good boxes inside, so now we're talking about an interval at scale k plus one. So we can look at it as a union of intervals at scale k. If all of them are good, then the, the intensity of the fact at scale k plus one is zero, and it's gonna be good as well. Now there is another possibility that all of them are good except for one. We call it J0. So that there is one sub-interval J0 which is bad. All the others are good. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the intensity of the sub-interval, which is HJ0, and we're going to subtract one. So it's kind of inducing a healing in the process. If you have a bad, in, a bad, bad defect, like size 10, in the next scale, it's regarded as a defect of intensity nine instead, if it's alone. If everything else in the box, all the brothers there are, are good, then the bad one becomes nine intensity. It re gets reduced by one. Now, what happens when they join together is it's the opposite completely. If you have two or more defects inside the box, we are gonna sum their intensities. And instead of giving a benefit, we're going to give a penalty of 20 times the number of them. So now it's really uh, bad when we see two defects in the same box, they, uh, they kind of join forces and they get this bonus of 20. Uh, the intensity gets added by 20 times the number of them. So this is a simple algebraic thing but that takes time to come up with the right definition. And you're gonna see that this is uh, this, the, the secret sauce. Uh, what we are saying intuitively here is the following. Uh, when we subtract one, we are saying this is not so bad of a defect. It's gonna, uh, you see, what we're saying is, you see, to prove in the environment, let, let me step back a little bit. If we didn't subtract anything in line two, if we didn't have this minus one, the facts would only grow, right? You'll find the defect of size two. In the next scale, it's going to have this two there, either alone, so it stays a two, or uh, together with something else, so it only grows. So things would only grow, grow, grow. You would never be able to say that a good box is a typical thing because the facts can only grow as they join together. So this minus one is saying, yeah, we, this is what makes the first renormalization easier. We're gonna show that things can heal and box can become good with time if nothing bad happens at the same time. At the same time, subtracting one here makes the percolation harder. We're gonna have to say, oh, when we are doing the percolation, we're going to show that the defect is actually better by being alone. We're going to do something in the percolation that gives us this plus one advantage. On the other hand, the third line, we are saying here is where we are very sloppy in the percolation, in the environment. 
it's going to be very easy to prove that the environment uh, satisfies the, the right inequalities because we are adding this 20 L here. On the other hand, oh, sorry, the opposite. It's going to be hard to, to control the environment because we are adding this 20. We're making it you know, much harder to, to control the, the, the intensity of the effects by just adding a 20 there. On the other hand, in the percolation, it can be very sloppy because you can just lose 20 and not bother. So it's going to be clear later. Uh, so what we prove in the first uh, renormalization is that the probability that a box is bad goes to zero reasonably fast with the scale. So typical boxes are good. Uh, so we are going to actually suppose something. So this is a typical good box, right? A typical box is good. So it has only good sub boxes and at most one it could have only good boxes, but there's also another possibility. It has one bad sub box with H equals one. Because if it's the only one and H equals one, we are going to subtract and now H becomes zero. So that's what we think when we think of a good box is everything good except for one that has H equals one. Is it clear? So this is actually, I'm afraid that I jumped to too fast into the proof and it may get too intense. So please interrupt if you have questions. So we're gonna make a simplifying assumption here that whenever a good box has a sub box that is bad, necessarily with H equals one, it's not gonna be either of the extremes. It's gonna be far from the extremes actually, like three distance three from the left and right extremes. This is going to simplify the exposition here. We have to deal with the, this in the real proof. And there will be other simplifications along the way. So I told you that we prove PK decays as uh, L to the minus 10, LK to the minus 10. But uh, we actually proved that. So this is stated here. PK is more equal than LK to the minus 10. But as I said, proving induction, things by induction, sometimes it gets easier if you prove something harder because what you're proving is also the input you get from the previous scale. So if you're trying to prove something harder, sometimes it gets easier. And that's exactly what happens here. We are not just proving that the probability to see something bad is small. We are quantifying this and saying that the probability to see something at, of a defect of intensity H at scale K the case like 500 to the minus 10 K minus 20 H. So we have a control both in the uh, probability with respect to the scale and with respect to the intensity of the defect. This of course implies the previous lemma. And why does it, why am I showing this? <coughs> because it becomes very natural after you add that penalty for the intensity of the defect. So, uh, let us think about what happens at scale zero, right? At scale zero, we have just a single point. The intensity of the defect is the Xi, which is a geometric random variable. So it does have an exponential decay. If we choose rho in a smart way, the exponential decay is going to be actually 500 to the minus 20 H. So this is easy to prove at scale zero for all H's. Now, if you jump from one scale to the next, we're gonna see this prod, this, you know, you, you have to, how, how the, the defects are formed by other defects, right? So you have several defects inside the box. And we said that the big defect is gonna be related to the sum of the, of the small defects, right? Plus 20L, but forget the 20L for now, just related to the sum. Why did they choose the sum? We could have taken the uh, ammonic average or any other thing. We chose the sum because it's exactly what appears uh, when we try to control them. So when we have three defects, what's the probability to find this three? It's the product. Since things are exponentially decaying, when you take the product, the product becomes a sum in the exponent. So you see that the sum is playing a, an important role. Uh, we have to control the entropy 
that is represented by the sum there. We have to sum over all the possible choices of the box number three has intensity 75, the box number eight has intensity three. So there is an entropy to control and I'm claiming we can control them by putting a triple dot there. But believe me, it's, uh, it's okay. It's uh, in these triple dots, there is something hidden of course, and it's exactly where the minus one and the plus 20 L play an important role. So we have to be very careful in this part. And this is where the minus one and plus 20 L uh, are important. But I wanted to put this bound there, intuitive bound, just to show that it's very natural to consider H to be the sum of H i's. Because, you know, the bound we have is an exponential one. The probability to have several of those is a product, so it becomes a sum in the exponent. Okay, so I will stop with the, the environment for now, and we're going to really talk about the percolation, which is, I think, the most interesting part. The, the, the environment is, after you have the right definitions, it's more of an exercise. So when you're doing percolation, we have to look at both the x-axis and the y-axis. So now we're going to be talking not only about intervals, but about boxes. So the same, we fix any scale k, and uh, position in the x-axis i, and in the y-axis j, and this gives us a box. Uh, there is a question in the chat, uh, if it should be 10k plus one, or perhaps referring to the previous slide. The previous slide? Yeah, last line. Oh yeah, sorry, I missed the plus one because we are bounding h zero k plus one. Right, so there should be a k plus one there, I'm sorry. Actually, there are more things missing, but I was just writing an intuition. Definition of, uh, so in this definition, sorry, too many pauses. Here, if it should be minus 20 L instead, uh, no, it's actually plus. So in one hand, you're saying isolated defects get healed. On the other hand, you're saying defects that join together get penalized a lot. So if you find two defects of intensity one in the same box, sharing the same box, it's going to become a 22 in the next case, terrible. Uh, you're saying, you're talking about this bound here? Yeah, I, I it was intentionally losing this bound. So indeed you have to put the 20 there. Um, so let me, I, I'll not explain the, the bound in detail. I'll just explain what saves your life there. I agree that you have a 20 L there that really harms the bound. Right? It's going to the, the terrible direction. On the other hand, you have more than one box that are bad, right? Let's say at least two. So it means you're going to have uh, two Ks there, right? It's going to have the minus 10K is going to appear twice. So you're going to get one of those that you didn't need and you're going to use to beat the, K, the 20s. So that's why we are only making it worse when there are more than one defect, because when there are more than one defect, you have the 500 to the minus 10K twice, appearing twice, and you get some spare room there. Is it clear? Great. So uh, maybe there are more questions on the environment? Okay, so let's go to percolation. We have these square boxes that we'd like to, to percolate on them, so to say. So first we're gonna look at um, the typical situation, right? 
we know that both the projection to the x-axis and to the y-axis, uh, in both in this in this both projections, we expect something good, right? With high probability, it's going to be good. And the probability that a box containing the origin is bad is smaller than one, right? It's you can sum over all the scales the box of that scale that contains the origin. This sum is you know 500 to the minus 10k. It's smaller than one. So with positive probability, the origin is only contained in good boxes. This is how we are going to obtain percolation in the end. We're going to, you know, navigate through these good boxes all the way to infinity. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so now that we we have uh, we we already defined uh, everything we want about the environment. We are going to start to do the percolation there. So having a box and opening and closing its edges with probability, you know, p to the xi, accordingly to the to what it should be, it's going to give us a cluster, a percolation cluster. And you'd like to have an analogy to what a good box is in in the percolation case. So you're not going to go call it good again because it's make, going to make a big confusion. So a box that is well percolating, we're going to call it filled to have a different word. So now we're really talking about the second renormalization, which is the quenching thing. So fix a good box. I'm going to say what it means for it to be filled. So at scale zero, we have a single site. A box is a site. It has two edges that we're going to uh, think that are associated to that site, the one going north and the one going east. And if these two are open, we say that box is filled. And you know, since the box is good, the probability of opening the north edge and the east edge is above P. So the probability to see a good box, a filled box, at scale zero is P squared, which you can make very hard if you very high if you want. Okay? And during this uh, procedure, we are not only going to define what a filled box is, but also we're going to identify in a field box a special cluster. So there is a special cluster that we can call the filling of a field box, which is a connected component. And in the case, the scale zero, it's going to be the point, right? If the box is filled, those two edges are open. We take that point and say, this is the filling of the box. Nothing special at scale zero. At scale one, we are going to do an inductive uh, definition so suppose two things. Suppose that we, in the previous scale, we already know when a box is filled or not. And in case it's filled, we already know what is its filling or the, the cl special cluster Cij. If we know all that, this is how we define the uh, filled box at scale k plus one. I expect all the sub boxes to be filled. If they are good, they should be filled except for one. We know we always do this like to get the square in the probability of bad things happening. If only one good box is not filled, we, we let it go, let it pass. But if there are two good boxes which are not filled, we say, okay, so the big one is not filled. And in that case, in, we, also ex, uh, we also require all the fillings of the good filled sub boxes to belong to the same connected component. Somehow, it happens that they belong to the same connected component. And this connected component, we call the feeling of the large box. So I have a picture for this. So you see this at the first look at the left picture. We have a box that is good, a large box that is good. So it means it has at most one bad column and one bad row. Everything else, all the small sub boxes that are not pink, they are good. So I expect them to be filled and I, re I mark them as gray if they are filled. Okay, maybe one is not filled, the white one. So I, I'm still okay with that. If it's a single one, it's fine. And I also expect, you see there are four regions there of uh, clusters of fillings. 
I expect all these gray boxes to belong to the same connected components. That's why I even drew some uh, gray paths uh, crossing the gray, the pink areas to show that everything in gray belongs to the same connected component. There could be small connected components inside that are not um, part of the filling. So I'm not saying that everything here is, a, is the filling is the only connected component, but I'm saying there is a special one, which is defined in the inductive way. In the right picture just can uh, zoom in and see what was happening in the previous scale to, to see that, you know, the, the definition is recursive. It's kind of a fractal definition. Every box now looks like the big one in the sense that it has its own cross, it has its own white dot, everything else is connected, even through the bed region. So, yeah, that was an intense definition, I know. Is there any question? So either good, you define the notion of being filled for both good and bad boxes? It doesn't matter no, if no. the big box is good or bad. No, no, only for good boxes. Only good boxes can be filled. Okay, because I was a little bit confused because in the, like, you have these, you only define the clusters for filled boxes, right? Yeah. But then you have like this, you have the gray, like in the horizontal bad region in your left picture that has like the gray clusters going through it, or is that, is that not considered a cluster? Yeah, this is not a, a cluster. This, I'm just saying that the clusters that are up there, they need somehow to connect to the clusters that are underneath, somehow. The easiest way is to find, you know, just a simple path. And, Maybe and there are more connections. They're, conne but they're connected by other clusters or by? No, it can be any. Uh, just connected in the percolation sense. Yeah. I see. Okay. It could be that everything is really, really bad, but you have a line that is open. So if they belong okay, to the like same. It's literally an open point. percolation path. Through it. Okay. Exactly. And you can really look microscopically there to find such connection. I see. Okay. Thanks. More questions? OK, so in the process of building these definitions, we are using recursion a lot. We are defining field in terms of field. And this plays very well with the probabilities, right? We're going to see this in a moment. When we prove that the probability that a box, a good box, is not filled is very small. So RK, I didn't define RK. I'm so, oh no, yeah, it's defined there. RK is the supremum over all possible environments under which the, uh, the let's say, the, the, this fixed box RK IJ is good of the probability that although it's good, it's not filled. Right? So we expect this to decay, and indeed, this decays with an exponential way with k. Although it looks like an exponential decay, you should think of it as more of a polynomial decay because the size of the box is also 500 to the k. So this is like LK to the minus two times a constant. So it's a polynomial decay. But in, in, with respect to the scale is exponential. So, we we'll stop for a moment and just prove the main theorem, assuming this decay, and then we're going to jump to the decay. So how do we prove that the origin is connected to infinity with positive probability under the assumption uh, that the lemma above is true? So just draw those boxes, all the boxes at every scale that contain the origin. We know that with positive probability, all of them are good. In the case all of them are good, uh, we can condition this and use the decay of RK to see that also the probability that all of them are filled is positive. If all of them are filled, so the origin has an edge going up and an edge going right, this is the cluster. We call the filling at scale zero of the origin. As you go one step up, that filling should be connected to all the fillings, making a big filling. And as you go up, one scale up and, and more and more, all these feelings are joined together and 
the origin belongs to an infinite connected component. So this is actually the easy part of the proof. What I wanted to say is like, forget that we are considering infinite range events like the origin connected to infinity. What really matters and in randomization is usually the case is that we control in a quantitative way what happens in the finite boxes. Later, we can use this quantitative control to prove things about infinite regions. So the important thing is to prove that good boxes are very likely to be filled. And this is the rest of the, the lecture, which is going to be uh, the, the, the part where we are going to communicate a lot with the definition of uh, the defects, right? The definition of age that I said was carefully crafted. So the ideal universe would be that there are no bad columns, right? It would be just be Bernoulli percolation in Z2. In that case, the probability that a box is not filled is really related to just the fact that there are no two white regions, right? If there are uh, all, if there is only one subbox that is not um, filled, then it's fine. If there are two, then it's complicated. Then it's not the, the big one is not filled. But this is not the only scenario, right? This would be ideal. If R k plus one was smaller, we could then the number of ways you can choose two boxes and pay the price for both of them to be non-filled. This we know contracts to zero very fast. It's kind of recursion by the previous lectures. But you see there is another problem, which is exactly the crossing the pink regions. It could be that everything that is good inside is filled, but they do not traverse the pink bars. That's what's hard to control. So that equation I wrote there is just uh, wishful thinking. What's really problematic is how to cross the bad region. It's not a terribly bad region, right? It's uh, it's h equals one there. It's the best bad region you can have. So for this, we define another parameter s k, which is going to be exactly related to the pro to the probability of crossing a bad region. So you have a good box in your left, a good box in your right. And in the middle, you have a box that uh, horizontally, it's not good because h equals one. On the y-axis, th the three of them are good, right? If one of them is good, all the others are good. But in the x-axis, it's like good, h equals one, good. Or h equals zero, h equals one, h equals zero again. And P sk is the probability that, you know, you don't do what you're expected to do. Either the extreme boxes are not filled or they are filled and their filling is not belonging to the same connected component. So this is the picture of what we actually want to cross the trap. So now we have two parameters, R and S, one related to good regions, one related to obstacles, and we want to bound those together at the same time. Like We bound both at the scale K, we want to bound both at scale K plus one. That's the induction. So the first lemma is the easy part. If we bound both R and S at scale K, are we able to bind to bound R at scale K plus one? Yes, that, that's the easy part. Why? Uh, we have to go back to this picture here uh, and realize, so if the big box is not filled, either there are two sub box which are not filled, this is in the definition, or all of them but one are filled, but they are not joined together. So it's easy to see that two field boxes that are neighbors, the, they connect to each other. The feeling has to connect because there is, it's like a pigeon hole principle. They, they don't have enough space to not connect. So the only danger is that you cannot cross any of these pink uh, triples. So in the end, what we get is if the big box is not filled, then either there are two smaller ones which are not filled, or there are two traps that you did not, that you didn't manage to cross. So this is 
the perfect scenario. You have rk plus one bounded by something rk squared and something sk squared. You know, we have bounds on both r and s. That's k, okay. So we place those bounds and put those bounds in place and we get a bound on rk plus one, which is exactly the bound we want. So what is the missing step? Is to assume that we control r and s at scale k and show that we control s at scale k plus one. That's the missing piece. Is it clear? It's like we're walking in this induction, controlling both r and s. We use this two to get r in the next scale, but now we should use this two to get s in the next scale. Then we move. But that's not exactly how we do it, <laughs> because crossing defects has a problem. As we go on our way to cross a defect that has h equals 1, what's going to happen? So what is a defect that has h equals 1? It has to be composed of a single defect in the previous scale. Because if there were two, <laughs> the defect would be 20 something, right? They add together and they get this bonus of 20. So a defect of h equals one is actually a single defect of h equals two, which is actually contains a single defect of h equals three, four, five, until 20 something. And then they can decide, maybe they are composed of two defects, small defects, or maybe it's really just all the way down to the to a single site that was ridiculously bad. So there are several possibilities, and it's impossible to control S without considering the probability to cross a, a larger defect with H bigger than one. So we have to define, uh, we have to consider the, what we do to cross larger defects, right? So this is how we're going to do it. Usually when you get to a large defect, it means that you have a large army to cross it. So if you're around my age, you probably played Lemmings in your childhood. So Lemmings was this game that little creatures were falling and you had to save them. And there were several deadly traps in between. And all you could expect is, you know, not to kill all of them so that a few would survive. <laughs> so this is the spirit here. You have usually a huge number of points to the left of your defect, and you just want some to survive after crossing. And the intensity of the defect is really going to tell you how many of them will survive or how many will die. And this will be the algebra that connects to the definition of the intensity of a defect. So. First of all, we have to restrict a little bit uh, how we try to cross the, the defect. I really go very quick through these slides because this is it's not very relevant for the rest of the, the talk, but we cannot take any army S and try to cross the defect for several reasons. First, if the army is positioned inside a horizontal defect, you see you're trying to cross a vertical defect. If all the points in blue were inside the horizontal defect, they would have a double problem, right? They have a difficulty horizontal and another difficulty in the vertical direction. So they would be doomed. So we want this defect to, this army to only intersect good intervals. So this is a restriction. Uh, and we want them to be kind of spread out. I'm not gonna enter much into the, the details, but these are inductive definitions as well that we have to, to impose to be able to cross the defect. So now we have the set S, which is regular in a sense. So they don't cross bad intervals, they're nice. And we try to cross the defect. So the algebraic intuition is the following. If you start with a regular army of lemmings and the size of this army is 400 to the K plus H minus one over two. And this little polynomial in the numerator like linear function actually, uh, is what took us a lot of time to, to come up with, just like the one in the environment. It is the algebraic thing that plays together with the environment. If you start with an army this size, so the army has, you're crossing a, de uh, a defect I did the right. 
at scale k and, and intensity h. Your arm should be 400 to the k plus something. It grows with h. After you cross, you'll be able to find the regular army of size 400 to the k. So you see, you're just doing some algebra in the exponent. You're to cross a defect of intensity h, you should give a boost to your army, which is h plus h minus one over two. And then you're gonna be just fine. You're gonna arrive to the right hand side with an army of 400 to the k. So this is the intuition which was always with us. So as I said, randomization, I, I find it very intuitive because we always thought like to cross a defect, you have to, you need a very big army. And how big the army? I mean, it has to grow exponentially with the height of the defect because crossing a defect gets exponentially harder, right? We can see this in the scale zero calculation that we're gonna show. Let, yeah, let me, before showing the calculation at scale zero, let me define properly what this arrow above means. So instead of dealing with S, which is the probability to cross H equals one, we're gonna deal with V. V is the probability that an army of the size above does not arrive to the right as an army of size 400 to the K. So we have a supreme move over several things, the probability that to the survivors do not contain a regular army of size 400 to the K. So what's the supremum taking over? All the possible intensities of the defect H, all the possible uh, environments for which the column you're trying to cross has defect H, and all the armies to the left that have the size you expect it to have to be able to cross. So this V is a kind of boosted version of S. Instead of bounding just the probability to cross the defect of height A1, you bound the probability of crossing defects of any height, any intensity. And again, it's the same thing that, we, that I said before. In induction, sometimes you want to bound something and it's easier to bind something, to bound something harder. But now we're trying to bound something harder than S because it includes all the scales, all the heights, sorry. And it becomes easier. So let's see, uh, as I said, VK is stronger than S. Let's see uh, how the, the calculation goes at scale zero. So at scale zero, this barrier that we're trying to cross is just a single line of sites. These sites have a Xi that is, means the number of closed columns to the right of it, which probably very high, right? It's the H. So maybe there are 30 uh, missing vertical lines there. So in order to cross this, if you start to the left, you have to pay P to the 30. It's very hard to cross this thing. But you really have to pay P to the height. So you the surviving army is going to be the size of the initial army uh, a Bernoulli, sorry, a binomial distribution with the initial army as the n, and the p is going to be p to the h plus one. That's the number of survivors. And you can, you know, this is a simple calculation. You can see that by choosing the army exponential in h and by choosing p very large, very close to one, uh, the probability to have no survivors is satisfying the bound we want. So we want to bound vk. And this is the bound we have, we want at scale k, at scale k equals zero. And what we're going to show is that if we have a control on R and a control in V in scale k, we are going to get a control in V at scale k plus one. So we're going to continue the induction, as I said. And I want to show how it goes because it's really the beautiful part of the, the argument. So when we are trying to cross a box at scale k plus one, there are two possibilities. Either it's composed of a single bad box in the previous scale, or it has multiple bad boxes in the previous scale. And why are we splitting these two cases? Because we split into those two cases when we were defining H. So it means that H will have different meanings in these two pictures. So let's start with the multiple defects, right? 
When you have multiple defects, the, de the intensity of the large box is going to be the sum plus 20 times the number of them. So it means that we have an army here, S, that is, very, is big, right? It's uh, 400 to the K plus 1 plus H minus 1 over 2. And we want to cross a multitude of bad boxes. How do we do this? One by one, right? It's induction. So we know how to cross the small boxes. So we are going to cross one by one until we cross the big, the big column. So using induction, we, we would like to cross the first uh, column, which has intensity H0. But the army we have is too big for this. It's not an army to cross H0. It's an army to cross H0 plus H1 until HL plus 20L still. So it's a very big army. What we do is split them into smaller armies. Each of them cross using induction. We count how many we arrive to the right. We group them into a single S. Now we have to cross H1. We split them, we cross. And you see that everything works very nicely because it's exactly the algebra we are talking about. Uh, the size of S is 400 to the K plus one. Now the sum of all the H's. So if you want just H0, you remove H0 from the sum, you cross and you lose H0, but you cross the first trap. Now you separate H1 of them, you cross the second uh, column, but you lose H1. So you keep losing things in the exponent until at the end you are left with 400 to the K. So the algebra works very nicely. The crossing traps in sequence really harms your no the number of our army in a multiplicative way, which since everything is in the exponent becomes a sum. Now what happens, so you see that here we can be very loose because we have the 20L there. I'm not doing the full calculation, but the 20L helps a lot here. We can be very loose and lose people. While we are splitting S into smaller groups, we can you know, be very imprecise and lose people that are in the boundary or something like this. The 20L really helps there. Now, what happens when you're crossing a single uh, a defect composed of a single sub defect? Now, the big defect is H. It has a single sub defect H0 and H is equal H0 minus one. So we have an army that is fully ready to cross should be fully ready to cross H. So it's 400 to the K plus one plus H minus one over two. And this is the picture. We, we go to the defect. That's very easy because everything is good. Then we cross the defect. We are gonna lose H zero in the exponent. And we are still left with K, uh, but K plus one quarter. So we, that's the point in this, uh, the fact that we subtracted one in H0 to make our life easy in the environment, make we fall short here. So after crossing the first barrier, just using induction, we don't get to where we wanted. We don't get the 400 K plus one. So there is no way around this. Since you subtracted one to make your life easier in the environment, now you have to show that you can compensate for that in the percolation. So you have to recover more points. You have to grow your army when you're crossing a single defect. And this is the right picture there. After you cross, you just find some piece of your army that is connected to a field box. And now we are really using the bound RK on the probability that a box is not filled. And we fill all these boxes and we manage to arrive to the right with a, a bigger army than we have crossed the defect. So we, we managed to recover. So in a sense, this is, uh, all, it's, it was the whole lecture to just pass this idea. There is a very nice algebra uh, that it interconnects the environment and the percolation. You have to say how bad the defect is in each situation. And you have to cross them uh, in response to what you defined as being easy or hard. So we defined easy to be isolated defects because they can 
uh, we can recover after crossing them. And we defined hard to be uh, multiple defects and it can be very sloppy there. So I think I'm reaching my time. So the takeaways are this uh, storytelling spirit that randomization has. I know that it was quite fast today's lecture. I hope that the first and second lecture had more of a storytelling. And this one was very like, here's the proof, pa, 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 sorry. But especially for us, uh, we're dealing with the problem. I think we could really grasp this storytelling during the, the development of the proof. So I'm really happy with this. Uh, there is this algebraic interplay between when you do two randomizations, they have to match. In the previous lecture, they already had to match, but it was a much uh, easier match. You just had to choose the exponents in a way that everything worked. But here, we really have to choose the algebra. Um, and now that we understand how to do this, I think there are several questions we are looking forward to try. These things can, you know, have interesting expansions in different dimensions and uh, you know, we, we're excited to, to the directions to come. And I wanted to finish with a nice quote from Vladas. So he loved this type of problems. And he also asked me, what is the sequence of ID Bernoulli random variables? Of course, all his questions were provocations. <laughs> so what he really meant is like, you know, you can describe a sequence of random variables like, uh, yeah, it's something What's the what's the sequence of random of Bernoulli random variables with a very small parameter of success, like one over thousand? So it's something that you know every one thousand steps happens, right? You wait one thousand and then poof, you get a a head in your coin. Then you wait you wait another thousand and poof, heads again. Okay, but sometimes probably after you wait one million, you're gonna see two heads, poof. poof. And then, you know, maybe three heads after a billion. So can you make this intuitive description into something first deterministic and true? And randomization actually managed to do this. So if you look at the proof we just uh, went through, you're taking an environment that's random. You're saying with high probability, it satisfies such and such. And now the second part of the argument has no connection with the randomness in the first part. Just saying, take the worst possible environment that satisfies ABC, and I can percolate there. So really saying, a ID Bernoulli sequence of Bernoulli random variables is this. It's something that has typically good boxes, and a good box is H, which is summed of H in the previous scale minus one, whatever, or plus 20L. You define what you expect the sequence of Bernoulli random variables to satisfy, and as soon they typically satisfy and you can survive in that environment. So every lecture I end with two pictures. And since Omer was a hiking, I um, put in two pictures of the last hike I did here in my city and the last hike I did in, it was not my pictures, but it are the same places I went uh, in Canada and in Belo Horizonte. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's thank everybody, Augusto. Thank you. Uh, so now uh, we'll stop the recording and then we'll have some questions. And the questions are going to be uh, hosted by Omer.